focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. jewelry sector plays a significant role in the Indian economy, accounting for about 6-7% to of the country's GDP and employing over 5 million workers. It's one of the fastest growing sectors in the Indian economy and despite the stringent norms for the export of gold jewelry by the government of India, it stays extremely export oriented. India Gold and Jewelry Summit, organized by the Gem and Jewelry Export Promotion Council, featured several seminars that tackled issues pertaining to the gem and gold jewelry industry in India. One of the key sessions in the summit was about value addition to jewelry manufacturing. This panel discussion was initiated with opening remarks by Managing Director of CKC Group of Jewelers, Vinod Hayagriv, and a speech on innovation in the retail industry by Executive Director of IBM India, Prashob C. Is there a minimum value addition requirement in our manufacturing side? Is there a minimum value addition requirement on our consumer side? Is there a strong disincentive for goldsmith thievery? Because we do hear every other month goldsmiths who take away some part of their raw material from the principal supplier. Can we bring in a very stringent control? Pollution control and goldsmith home insurance. Can we tie up with international companies and expertise to bring in technology, bring in finishes, bring in ways in which we can increase the quality of our product? World over are willing to share their knowledge with India. Can we bring in a beneficial tie up? By 2020, the average age of this country is going to be 29. We would have 500 million millennials entering to the main stage. They are ruthless, they are restless, and they would like to see things in a manner in which that is palatable to them. Now, if you just look at India as a country, now this is primarily we divided each of the state by the population. So that means we are actually 21 nations. And then we have like 900 odd like languages. But on the same time, we have like one unifying unit called as Aadhaar. By using the Aadhaar and we have this, all the digital things that is up and running, this is the time for us to really think. Because today, like your retail shop would be like you know, flooded with a lot of customers. But like by 2020, those customers will not be there because you will see the new millennials coming in. So if we don't change the in-store experience today, two years from now, then we will have completely a different challenge. So this is a time for us to really reinvent. So with that note, primarily like what are the changes that is taking place in the uh, retail? So there is so much of artificial intelligence that is taking place. Today you could just walk into the showroom, you could actually get the entire like ornament to be overlaid on you without you actually physically trying it out. So some of you would have been tried that lens card. So in the lens card, like if you want to just change your lens, you could just go to the site, you could overlay yourself into that particular the box and all those like lens keep trying it and whatever you feel is appropriate, you could pick it up and that get home delivered. And today like the retail, if not today, tomorrow, it is headed towards that particular space. Nilesh Hundekri, partner Asia Pacific AT Kearney, moderated the panel, which included the who's who of the jewelry world, including Sandeep Kulhali from Tanish, Kapil Hetam Sarya, founder of VelvetCase.com, and the renowned jewelry historian Usha Balakrishnan. The topic for the session is uh, value addition through manufacturing, and let's talk about how design can add value. So I'm going to ask uh, ask Shimul, what is her take on design in, in jewelry? I think if we look at the Indian jewelry sector. Uh, so far, our emphasis and, you know, uh, uh, the growth has been propelled more by the manufacturing prowess that we have. And uh, I think that has been, you know, it has been leveraged to the extent possible. And what is important, therefore, now, and if we are to achieve this whole target of 25 billion, you know, dollars exports by 2022, I think for value addition, design is something that my submission would be that the industry takes it very, very seriously and integrates it as a very, very important component of the value chain. Thank you. Um, 
a very sharp question in any consumer product where design is important. If 100% is the price of the product, what percentage of the value we should be on account of design? Well, I think it could be infinite if I'm not to exaggerate, because design also, design is never about the actual value of the product. What design helps you to do is enhance the perceived value of the product. So essentially that is where I think design can pay, play a very, very crucial role. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of uh, retailers present here to comment on how they use design as a differentiator. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Sandeep uh, first and then Suvankar after that to comment on in your businesses, how do you use design to create value? We have pursued that line from the birth of the brand 22 years back where we tried to pitch jewelry as an adornment piece, not an investment category. And that's a corporatization process that we've helped make Tanish different from the jewelers is because we invested in design differentiation. Now the challenge is, unfortunately, and this is in a lighter vein, uh, jewelers have taught so much to the customers, they seem to know more about jewelry than the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And for the wrong reasons, unfortunately. So therefore design language is confusing between quantity of jewelry in the store versus the design differentiation. And if you look at the Tanish model where our inventory is probably 40% lower than an average inventory of a jewel, but the differentiation per se in each design that we make has been one of the critical reasons why we managed to get a premium from a consumers on a commodity based product category like jewelry, more in gold as well as in diamonds. So therefore look at the whole process and like I said, corporatization includes the entire value chain and one of the strengths that we have is we control the entire value chain, which is right from customer understanding product development, manufacturing, designing, manufacturing by itself either in, inside our factories or through our vendor partners through a very strong management of the vendor operations to a retailing, to after sales service and thereby the entire value chain. We managed to get value in every process. So I'm going to jump uh, straight away to Mr. Nore Eisler and uh, he's the chairman of the Istanbul Chamber of Jewelry. And uh, Turkey is actually a, a very fascinating a comparison uh, for India. So I'm going to ask Mr. Nori Eisler to give us a, a brief overview of the Turkish jewelry industry and having heard about the Indian jewelry industry, what are the three, four things that he will, he will tell the Indian jewelry industry? We have now 40,000 company and uh, more than 400,000 people workers uh, for this sector from Turkey. We have another program now another 100,000 people we like to introduce this sector also. Uh, how we will do that one? I explain this a little bit. We have a uh, tax for diamonds. When I import the country diamond, 26% uh, tax we need to pay for the only diamond side. And we have a huge manufacturing there. When I bring the merchandise from outside, jewelry finish merchandise, that time there is no tax. This is unbelievable. And uh, this one we talk with the government and thanks God we finished that situation. So I'm going to ask, ask Usha to talk a little bit about uh, our rich heritage and how can that be leveraged for the growth of the Indian jewelry industry. As far as um, antique Indian jewelry is concerned, um, the world loves India. The world loves old Indian jewelry. And sadly, uh, the greatest promotion of Indian jewelry, of antique Indian craftsmanship and antique Indian jewelry happens outside India. It doesn't happen here in India. We don't have a single gem and jewelry museum in India. Even though for 5,000 years we have been the, the soul, the heart of the German jewelry industry of the world. Our greatest collections are lying in storage. Um, they are not exhibited, they are not taken around the world, they are not even allowed, uh, people in India itself are not allowed to see these collections. So I hope, you know, these things act as a catalyst um, for, for the government, uh, for people in the industry to, um, to be conscious of your heritage. I think it's very important. I think one of the big problems here in India is unlike the great jewelers of the West like a Cartier or a Tiffany or a Van Cleef, there's an amazing amount of documentation. You go to any old Indian company and say, can I see some of your old designs? 
No. Can I see some of their records? No. Do you know the history of your family? No. So, I mean, we don't have the pride in our own heritage that everybody in the West has, very, very with few exceptions over here. I'm going to uh, jump to uh, Kapil Hitam Sarya. How does the online world look different uh, when it comes to jewelry? And more importantly, do you think of your company as, a, uh, as an e-commerce company or you think of yourself as a jewelry company? Or you think of yourself as a mix of both? So we're sort of building a platform. We, we, we think of ourselves as the intersection of jewelry and technology. Uh, being very, very focused on jewelry as a domain and using technology as an enabler to really scale things which are doing really well in terms of design, commodity. So every single partner that we work with has to bring something which is unique um, to be on the platform. Both partners and designs are actually curated by us. Um, even today and therefore you know the, for the consumer uh, it, 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 it offers um, uh, an amalgamation of what you might be able to find across literally the smallest of uh, jewelry hubs that may exist in the, in the country. One thing I'll add uh, our, our largest selling so you know one of the experiments we ran was actually working with international designers create for who would design, we would manufacture on their behalf and sell it in India. I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Srinivasan, uh, who's, uh, who's a miracle by himself and he's, he's created uh, one of the most fabulous uh, jewelry businesses uh, and a sterling example of uh, what one could actually create uh, in an organized manner. For a long time it was believed that to cater to the domestic market, uh, you actually cannot create an organized jewelry manufacturing business. There was no market. Um, and therefore, people who got into manufacturing were focused largely uh, on exports. So, tell us about what's the secret of your uh, success. See, if you don't change the design, I think uh, you will not be in the market for a future. Why? Because these millions, you know, they don't uh, like the regular designs. Their uh, mind is different, their exposure is different, their expectation is different. Um, I am sure uh, if you want to attract this millionaires, we should introduce uh, technology in the jewelry. Then only we will succeed. Thank you very much and thank you to the panelists for a wonderful discussion. GJEPC understands that to promote investments in exports and to bring the sector at par with international markets, a jewellery industry code of conduct needs to be developed. The next session in the summit addressed this very issue. HS Pasricha, marketing head at Bureau of Indian Standards, was at the summit to set the conversation rolling with a special address. The BIS formulates, recognizes and promotes Indian standards and his address had some valuable advice for the whole industry. We all know the love for gold in India. It's just akin to China. As far as the standardization in the gold field is concerned, it is the two aspects. One is gold refinery sector and second is the gold jewelry. The common man uh, is more concerned with the gold jewellery part and so the hallmarking scheme which is an international practice running in various countries including UK for more than 700 years. Uh, this scheme hallmarking is always done on precious metals. So we have four precious metals, known precious metals, gold, silver, platinum and palladium for which this scheme is there internationally. And presently in India, we are running it for gold and silver only. So the test methods, the methodology of hallmarking we are following in India is following the best practices internationally. Now the code of conduct for the industry, I think the code of conduct for any industry, for any, so any society is the basic things, basic fundamental two things, that we work with integrity and ethics, and we work not to harm others. If any society works on these two principles, I think everything falls in line. And for the industry specific, I think the change has to start from me. 
we have to transform our mindset that the right priority is our base. No questions are. That is our base. And then focus to value addition, to design, creativity. See, see the garment industry. What is the value of design creativity there? But I don't think the jewelry industry has been able to adopt that. And associations like JJEPC, GJF, IBGA and others, I think they need to promote this along with BIS and work hand in hand. And then so that everybody, it is best that everybody joins in a voluntary regime so that it is easily, they can transform their business by adopting this hallmarking as a tool for changing their customers. Thank you. So let's first look at the raw material bits. There's been a lot of talk about this. Uh, for the benefit of uh, jewelers that are here in the audience, uh, responsible sourcing of mine dore to gold is what the Kimberley certification is to diamonds. All of you understand Kimberley certification for diamonds, and therefore the equivalent of that when it comes to gold is a responsible sourcing. Uh, I start with you, Sakila. You're the only lady on the panel, so you're first. You know, when it comes to uh, sourcing mine dore, there is a common thread. You need to look at anti-money laundering, combating terrorism, financing. You need to look at avoiding contribution to conflict. You need to look at human rights abuse addressing environment degradation. So, uh, from an LBMA perspective, how significant is this into your good delivery system? From an LBMA's perspective, responsible sourcing has become actually the most important and probably the most riskiest area because it's very important for us to know where is that gold coming from, the origins. It's very important because it speaks to the integrity of the program. It speaks to the integrity of the LBMA, the, um, the banks, the downstream, the upstream. So it's very important to the good delivery system. And it's now become so interconnected. It's not just about the technical standards. So if you think about how important it is to know the purity of the gold, is it really gold in that bar? It's just as important to know where that gold is coming from. Currently, hallmarking is stipulated 14 carat, 18 carat, 22 carat. Why? Why could it not be any carriage? After all, the, the assay center is determining the purity of the gold. So why should it be 14, 18, 22? Why can't it be whatever the jeweler likes? Exactly. As long as it's a whole number. Exactly. That's, that's what is the demand of the industry. Earlier, it was not restricted to 14, 18, and 22. And uh, most of the places in India, uh, there are uh, jewelry which is sold like in Maharashtra, it is sold in 23 carat. Uttar Pradesh, it is sold in 20 carat. And internationally, there is jewelry which is in 9 carat also. So the basic purpose of the hallmarking centers is to assess the purity of the jewelry and they have to mark that. And what we should insist upon is the marked jewellery should be sold. Okay. So, so you I think this uh, 14, it should be for any, any mark. to be scrapped. Yeah. So, Rindu Bhai, what is your view on this? About character edge, Avinash has already mentioned. I would also like to add one more thing about the hallmarking. The jeweller should ask for in-house certification. See, logistically, it is a big issue. Why should why should an uh, emerald who has a factory in 20 carat need to, uh, 20 acres, need to move his material from a 20 acre factory to a 2,000 square feet hallmark office? So, it's a logistic issue. It's a, there, there, is, there are security concerns. So, the in-house certification of hallmarking must be permitted. That is another issue I think the jewelers need to take. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Thank you.
en el 